one minute and we'll we'll get going um so so welcome uh we are uh we're on our we're about to finish i hope today close to finish chapter two of the human condition uh which is on the public and private realm we started speaking about it uh last week last month and um just to set the stage again and to remind ourselves uh, why this is important, uh, uh, it's not about human nature, but it's about those conditions uh, of human life uh, as it has emerged on the earth uh, over the last few thousand years, and namely those conditions that as that life has emerged have, uh, in Arendt's opinion, um, made human life uh, meaningful and uh, and have constituted what it means to be human. Um, one, three of the main category, the main activities of human life, as Arendt understands it, are labor, work, and action. These are these are part of what she means by uh, the human condition. They're part of what she calls the vita activa, the active life. And as she says in the prologue, as we discussed a few months ago, this uh, active life, this human condition is threatened today. Uh, it is threatened by um, a number of things, but two that she talks about in the prologue are the rise of uh, technology and science, namely the launch of Sputnik, which she says has a has the capacity to change the very nature uh, uh, of what man is by taking away or making ever more difficult its earthliness, right? She said, earth is the quintessence of the human condition. And we talked about what earthliness meant. It was the fact that man lived a life that was not fully controlled, that he was born, that he died, he didn't control his entire life. And that we are in danger, she says, of of ending that, of of transforming that world. Two of the two important aspects of the human condition and of the world, as she understands it, are the fact that man has always had a public and a private realm, and uh, this is being threatened now by the rise of what she calls the social, which we talked about last last month. In sections seven and eight and nine, we have her describing uh, what the public realm is and then what the private realm is. And um, these are incredibly important uh, chapters in her book. Uh, she believes that both the public and the private realms are absolutely essential for what it means to be human. And um, we need to understand why, and then understand why they are both threatened by what she calls the rise of the social. So I wanna start with section seven, the public realm or the common. And as often uh, is the case right there in the title, she tells you the answer. The public realm is important because it provides us with what is common. She says, um, we should turn your mics off. Turn your mics off, please, if you haven't. Um, the public realm is important because it's the common, and she says there are two closely interrelated but not altogether identical phenomena that signify the pu public. And the first is on page 50, and it's simply the fact that everything that appears in public can be seen and heard by everybody and has the widest possible publicity. Um, this is this is a, a point that is made over and over again in different of Arendt's writings. It's absolutely essential to understanding her, her, her overarching thinking. And it is that um, appearance gives reality. Um, whereas for most of philosophy, as you well know, uh, truth or being is what's most real, as Plato says, whereas appearance is false and appearance is deceptive. Arendt uh, argues that it's the opposite, that appearance is what is most real 
And she says in the next sentence, for us, appearance, something that is being seen and heard by others as well as by ourselves, constitutes reality. Um, that's an incredibly uh, important and fascinating uh, point that she wants to make. In a sense, what she's saying is that for human beings, uh, the way we appear to ourselves and to others is the real world in which we live in, right? She's, she's here making a point that is in many ways opposed to Platonic philosophy, but also opposed to Kantian idealist philosophy and all scientific thinking, because the essence of scientific thinking is that what is true is not what you see, but is what accords with universal laws that often you can't see or perceive, but you can know. And the the reason that scientific philosophy is arises at around the same time as epistemology with Descartes and Kant is because that for Descartes and Kant, again, we don't actually see the things themselves. We don't know with certainty the truth of the world. Um, what we know is what we see and imagine through our um, uh, through our eyes. And so. Uh, this is this is an, an essential disagreement with the history of philosophy and with the rise of science. And what she's saying is that uh, what is most important for humans, what is most real, um, is actually what appears. Now, what appears doesn't have to be na nature, natural. It can be storytelling. It can be artworks. It can be um, artistic transposition of individual experiences, as she says in the middle of the page. The point is that what appears can be artificial and, and, and beautiful and remade, but what appears is what is real. Um, and um, because the public world, the common world is what we share and is what is real, um, we also need a private realm because we can't all live in constant transparency. We can't all live in constant uh, uh, being exposed to the bright light of the constant presence of others, as she says on page 51, right? We need a place um, to hide. There are certain things that don't and can't exist in the public realm. And she names many things in these few chapters and others and others, but things like love, right? Love cannot exist, she says, in the public world. If you publicize your love to somebody, it becomes weak. Goodness, she'll say in, in section 10, um, is something that as soon as it becomes too public, loses its quality of goodness. It must be held uh, private. Um, wisdom, another thing that is not to be made too public. Um, and so the first way, the first phenomena of the public realm is this idea of appearance and the appearance to many others. The second, which she mentions on page 52, and she says in the bottom, in the second to last paragraph on 52, second, right? The term public signifies the world itself, insofar it is common to all of us and distinguished from our privately owned place in it. Now we've talked a fair bit in the last few months and meetings about what the world is. The world is different from the earth, it's different from the world of nature. It's the artificially created human world. And so the public is not simply the common as that which appears, but it's the common that which appears that, the, that we as humans make. It's the political world. It's the world that we um, make through our uh, actions and our works of art. Uh, it's the world that we um, uh, share together uh, as human beings. And she gives this example on page 53 of the table on the top of the page. She says, the weirdness, this is about three lines down from the top of page 53, the weirdness of this situation resembles a spiritualistic seance <laughs> where a number of people gathered around a table might suddenly, through some magic trick, see the table vanish from their midst, so that two persons sitting opposite each other 
were no longer separated, but also would be entirely unrelated to each other by anything tangible. And what she means by that is that the table, a thing that we make and put in the world, unites us because when we sit around the table, we are sitting around the table. Here, we're united on this computer, on this screen. And she says, the common things of the world gather us uh, and bring us together and make a world in which we live. Um, that's what the public is. It's both the fact of appearance, that appearance is what's real, and that a world comes to appear that is comprised of things and actions that we make and that last. And when we get to the section on work in a couple, in a couple of sessions, you'll see that it's the work of the artist and the work of the craftsman that creates things that last and have duration and thus make a world. And of course, it's also the work of the politicians who create states or polities that last, that make a world. And so uh, on one level, this chapter on the public and thus the common is just telling you that one of the most important things about being human is to live in a world, to live in a common world. She then is also going to talk a little bit about the danger to this common world. And one of those dangers is mass society, right? Um, mass society in which uh, instead of you having your table and I having my table, but we also understand what a table is, in a, in a mass society, um, everybody has their own table. Everybody has, and everyone says, well, I don't like your table, I want my table. Um, everyone becomes their own subject. Everyone becomes their own most important person because everyone is equal. I mean, that's the essence of mass society. Since we're all equal, we're all the same. We each have our table. And as soon as I say to you, but you know what? Your table is not really a table. I'm sorry, but it's only got two legs. It's not going to work. You say to me, who are you to judge, right? Who are you to judge? You're the same as me. You have no power over me. I say, this is a work of art. You say, no, mine's a work of art. And someone else over here says, no, that's a work of art. And we say, well, who are you to judge? We're all equal. And so in mass society, we have as many works of art and as many artists as there are people. And thus we lose sight of the common, which is that which holds us together. We lose sight of the true. We lose sight of the beautiful. And so aren't, uh, worries that the uh, rise of mass society uh, will um, threaten the power of the common or the public. Um, she also talks about the, the rise of the uh, petit bonheur of the French people, right? The idea that there are many small things with what we're, which, which we're enchanted within the space of their own four walls. I have a nice little chest or a nice drawer that I bought from Louis XIV or a dog and a cat and a flower pot, right? Um, and what she says is all these little things, we care more about having them, this is on page 52, than that they last, that then that there's quality. We, we replaced the world of endurance and quality with a world of Little, beautiful, little pretty objects that we like, tchotchkes, right? Um, and we have tchotchkes all over our house and they make our house personal, but they disappear. They don't last. You don't pass tchotchkes down to your children, right? You pass things that endure, artworks or, or craftsmanship works down to your children. And so what she's saying is that greatness has given way to charm on page 52. Uh, and you can't have a lasting and deep, meaningful public realm without things that deserve to be remembered, without greatness. And that's what she's um, talking about here in, 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 in this chapter on, on, on the public world. So the last thing I wanna say about this chapter is on pages 54 to 55. Um, 
And you'll see in the middle of 54, she uses the word worldlessness. Worldlessness is the quality of a common world in which there is no or a lesser degree of a common world. Um, and she says, worldlessness as a political phenomenon is possible only on the assumption that the world will not last. And so we talked a lot about how in chapter one, the third part of chapter one, she said that immortality was the essential, was different from eternity, but immortality is the essential prerequisite for a world. You have to believe that you can create immortal things. You have to believe that you can be a great artist or that there are great artists and there are great politicians who will create artworks and political entities, political institutions that last in order to create a world that makes a claim on all of us in it to gather around and hold it in common. And so she'll say at this, um, in a couple of lines uh, below, um, we need we need immortality. And she says, the Christian abstention from worldly things is by no means the only conclusion one can draw from the conviction that the human artifice, the human artificially made world, a product of mortal hands, is as mortal as its makers. If we, if we, if we lose belief in immortality and we believe that all we can do is make mortal things, well, one option is Christian abstention from the world. We, we leave the common world and enter the world of Christian, um, the private world of Christian life. But the other option, if we're not religious, is that the loss of immortality can, on the contrary, intensify the enjoyment and consumption of the things of the world. All manners of intercourse in which the world is not primarily understood to be koinon, common, that which is common to all. And so if Christianity is one response to the loss of the common world, to the immortal world, consumerism is another. The idea that we will um, simply enjoy and consume the things of the world because they're not going to last anyway. And thus she says, only the existence of a public realm and the world's subsequent transformation into a community of things which gathers men together and relates them to each other depends entirely on permanence. If you don't have the idea of permanence, that there might be an immortal institutions and immortal works and immortal things, then you cannot have the public realm. A public realm, she says, must be erected or it cannot... It, it cannot not be erected for one generation, right? You can't erect a public realm just for one generation. You have to hope and expect that it will last. And thus it must transcend the lifespan of mortal men. And then I just wanna read this next sentence, which is deeply important. Without this transcendence, now what does transcendence mean? She's using it here in a philosophical sense where trans means beyond, and sendence means to step or to walk, sendare. So it's without stepping beyond what? Your private, individual, narcissistic, selfish life. Without stepping beyond your private into a public. And thus into a potential earthly immortality, a public that can last and endure for multiple generations. No politics, strictly speaking, no common world and no public realm is possible. And so here you get why the public realm, the common realm is possible for RN. What the common and public realm are, are the world of artificial building of a political uh, reality, a political world we share together that we think deserves to be preserved for generations and generations. It is the uh, it is what um, action towards higher ideals is. It is to build a public world uh, that can last for generations, and that's why the public and the common are are so important for our end. So um, let me stop there for us.
minute and see if there are questions about uh, chapter seven. You can turn your mic off and, and ask a question. Turn your mic on uh, and ask a question if you like, um, and let me know what you're thinking. I, I'll say that um, she, she on the last paragraph of this chapter on page 58, she worries about two ways that you can destroy the common world. One is through tyranny, which isolates individuals, because in a tyranny, you, your opinion doesn't matter and you live in a completely private life, the, the, the tyrant rules. And the other is, she says, the radical subjectivism of mass culture, right? Or mass society and mass hysteria, in which we are all people behave as they were members of one family where everyone is equal, where everyone is the same. They all think they are equally important and thus they all pursue their own ideas, their own dreams, their own private lives, their own consumption without trying to um, build something bigger than themselves. And these are the two ways she thinks that the common world can, can disappear. So are there, are there questions? Uh, uh, yeah, Roger, I have a, just a quick question. Yep. Um, in thinking about the, the common world, is that, um, is that sort of a nod or an interpretation of intersubjectivity? That um, we have a, a common world that, that, is, um, that we are sort of born into and is sort of pre-interpreted and um, we, we uh, get a shared sort of meaning from that common world? Okay, great, Rod. Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent question. So the answer is, in some sense, yes. If you, but not naturally per se. So if you, but if you would, when we read the section on action, you'll see that uh, she says that plurality is the uh, presupposition for all political action. Plurality meaning that all of us are different, are uh, unique individuals, and yet. At the same time, there also must be a kind of equality, um, a kind of sameness so that we can actually talk to each other and engage each other. Um, the, the sameness is something which says we're all equal citizens. And the plurality is, even though we're all equal citizens and we share a common world, we're all deeply different and unique with radically different opinions and radically different prejudices. And then this is something that I think has to be taken very seriously in our end. She's not, she's a fan of prejudice. She prejudgments. She thinks that we're all different. And um, she, she believes that the, the task of politics is to find the basic common world and common denominators that we share, the common respect that we can enter world equally on without sacrificing the meaningful opinionated prejudices and difference that separate us. Um, and so for her, plurality, difference, real difference, uniqueness, is a deep ontological characteristic of what it means to be human and to live in a public world. Uh, and thus for her, human existence is always going to be if, if I use, I, I don't know, the word is one I don't usually use, but intersubjective is the word you used. If I understand what you're meaning by it, the world for her is always a world that um, is built both by the differences and the samenesses, and thus the relations, the in-between relations of the different people in it. Is, is that what you mean by intersubjective or, or not, Rod? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I think where I'm approaching this is from um, sort of a Habermasian or thinking about uh, sort of Mead and thinking about um, the we, through interaction, we sort of create uh, a shared world, but it can never be completely shared because of our own subjectivities within that space. Okay. And so um, I'm just trying to make a connection to to Arendt and, and understand if that's the kind of thing that she's intending. And, and it sounds like there are some parallels there, that there are um, there have to be some shared meanings or understandings. Otherwise, communication is not possible, but we can never fully know um, what another is sort of bringing to the conversation or to the interaction. 
That's right. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of similarities. The the difference from a Habermas Habermasian line, just to, to to make it clear, is that for Arendt, there is no rational way to um, make a claim of 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 truth or 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 or, or morality. All truth claims and morality in politics are opinions. And as opinions, um, the only way they can be uh, asserted is through persuasion. And so unlike Habermas, who has this idea that uh, what holds us together is not just that we have certain works and certain institutions that we share, but a certain rationality that we share that if we understand it well, will allow us to agree if I understand Habermas correctly, at least if we get close to it, Arendt doesn't think that at all, and in fact welcomes disagreement and is much more open to a real kind of disagreement than someone like Habermas is, if I understand the two of them correctly. Is that fair, Rod? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Okay. Um, I, I think it's interesting that this idea, although Habermas would probably claim that um, his philosophy encompasses parts of RNs, but he claims that about um, nearly everyone. So there you go. Uh, That's right. So anyway, yes, thank you. I have, I have one more question that's been written in by Kazueg. Uh, so by definition, according to Arendt, the social is ruled by the interest of each group, which is essentially the opposite pole of transcendence. I think that's right. If transcendence is this idea of um, stepping over from our individual interests into a common interest. The private uh, would be ruled by individual unique interests and the social would be ruled by group interests. And um, the worry that our end has is that the social is taking over both the public and private, but we'll get there. Uh, you know, we, we talked about that a little last class. The idea is to the, and this comes back to Rod's question with Habermas, for our end, the social, the idea that there is a common interest to all uh, that we can, in a sense, rationally, technocratically determine, um, uh, thus uh, can be used to both um, deny individual unique private interests, but also um, deny the need for uh, a public world at all, because if we all agree, and if a rational realm is, is running things, we don't actually have to engage in, in, in the public realm. And that's where the social endangers both the public and the private. So let me move on to the, to the next section, section eight, the private realm. So if the public is this common world of transcendence, um, the private realm, um, is uh, based in the idea of property. And um, this, is, uh, this is important for those of you who are following the RN Center uh, at all. You, you know that, I think you'll know that our, our upcoming fall conference in October of 2015 is on uh, privacy. Uh, it's called uh, Privacy, uh, Why Does It Matter? And um, it's very much comes out of these few chapters here in RN. And she talks about this in many other places as well, but this is this is the the root of it. So this is something that I, I find I, I'm particularly interested in right now. In this section, section eight, um, she's going to develop four ideas of the private. Okay, and I want to go through them one by one because they're all important, um, and they're all uh, and and they're all in some way related to privacy, I mean, to the prop to property. So the first idea of privacy is the first, is the one she reads, begins right at the beginning. It's the privative idea. It is with respect to the multiple significance of the public realm that the term private in its original privative sense has meaning. To live an entirely private life means above all to be deprived of things essential to a truly human life, namely, reality of what appears and is seen and heard of with others it's to live an insignificant life so this is the the first negative idea of of privacy it's to be completely um inhuman to be completely private uh and and it's where the word 
privacy as a privation comes from. Um, the, the second uh, important uh, idea of, of privacy is what she calls the non-privative idea of privacy, um, which she begins to develop on page 61. And this is where it gets, I think, more interesting and more important. So if you look on 61, she says, the profound connection between private and public manifest on its most elementary level in the question of private property is likely to be misunderstood today because of the modern equation of property and wealth on the one side and propertylessness and poverty on the other. The point that she wants to make, and this is a, a, a point that, again, is very important in much of her work, is that wealth and property are not the same thing. Property um, is important because it is what is most our own. It's what's proper to us. In German, Eigentum. It's what's Eigen is our own. In, in English, it's proper. It, as proper, property gives us a sense of who we are. If you own a house, if you own an heirloom desk, if you own a beautiful book of Hannah Arendt's first edition, these things that you own um, give you a, a kind of a place in the world. And they are very much I, caught up with who you are as a person. They give you a location in the world. Uh, and thus there's a sacredness to property. So that you, you know, we thought old estates were passed down through generations and they have names and they have stories and they have personalities. And a house that lasts and is made and given over to, to generations has a kind of sacredness to it. At the same time, the house and the property has a kind of mysteriousness to it, and it hides certain parts of yourself from the public. And so this idea of property, she says, um, is, is deeply important. The problem is, is that in the modern era, which she thinks begins with the expropriation of the peasants um, from their land, is characterized by the transformation of property into wealth. And wealth doesn't actually require physical, tangible property. It just requires money and not even physical, tangible money, but, uh, you know, Bitcoin or whatever it is that one has today. Um, but it requires just that you have a certain value or wealth that's exchangeable and, and transferable. And so wealth um, diminishes the ability of property to uh, be a, a space for your sacred, for a sacred space and location in the world. The third way that property uh, is to be understood and important in in, in private realm and in privacy is she talks about on page 63. And it is this idea of the exterior appearance of, this, of, of, of property, that property is a boundary. And as a boundary and a boundary line, it separates us from others. And this goes back to the, the public. You need to be both common, but also separate. And so on the one hand, Property can, uh, can separate one city from another and make it a common public world. But in, within the city, it separates um, uh, each house from each house and thus um, provides certain laws and also rules for both privacy and also when you enter the public realm. So the idea of my house is my castle um, is what she has in mind here. both It's both my castle and that I can retreat to it and be hidden, but it also is when I leave the house, it defines when I'm in a public world and I'm in a private world. And it, for her, this is um, an important part of, of what privacy does. Is it, 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 it allows us to be both private and public. Uh, and then the fourth uh, way 
uh, that she describes privacy and private realm here comes back to wealth. When wealth replaces property, she says, it devours both property and privacy. So um, she says on page uh, 64, it is therefore not really accurate to say that private property prior to the modern age was thought to be a self-evident condition for admission to the public realm. It is much more than that. It's more than that. It was that, but it's more than that. Privacy was like the other, the dark, hidden side of the public realm. And while to be political meant to attain the highest possibility of human existence, to have no private place of one's own, like a slave, meant to be no longer human. And so you, I think you'll see why this is what we're going to be talking about at our Center conference this year, both with surveillance by the government, but also with um, the complete uh, abandonment of property by individuals through transparency and whether it's Amazon or, 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 or Google or Apple or whatever brand you give your privacy to, we are living in a world in which um, even though people continue to sometimes say privacy is important, although more and more people are saying it's not, um, they act on a daily basis to give up their privacy. Uh, and they will continually trade their privacy for the claim of security and the claim of convenience. And um, for Arendt, privacy is absolutely necessary in order to be human because you need these non-privative aspects of privacy, namely that privacy makes you, protects the mysteries of your life that makes you deep and gives depth to life. It protects the boundaries to the public where you know when you're in private and public. And it also, um, as, as she says, uh, it, it is absolutely necessary to give you a place of your own so that you can develop into who you are and not completely influenced by the algorithms and by the uh, social uh, reason of, 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 this, of society. Privacy is thus deeply important for individualism and for freedom. Um, and so we're living in a world in which uh, privacy is being uh, circumscribed on an, on an unheard of level. Uh, voluntarily by people giving up privacy for convenience and security. And, um, and that's what the conference uh, in the fall was going to be about. So that's um, chapter eight. Before I move on to chapter nine, are there some questions about chapter eight? The privative and non-privative idea of privacy. So chapter uh, seven was about why the public is important. And chapter eight is about why the private is important. And then chapter nine is gonna be about the social and how it comes to impact the private. And we'll also talk a little bit about how it influences the public as well. But are there, are there questions? Question. Yes, hi, John. Yes, Roger, can you hear me? I do. Um, in um, in what I was reading, you know, I thought I was, even though, as you were just saying, you know, privacy is absolutely you know, critical, I thought I was reading that she w was saying that private life, you know, you know, didn't really exist until just a few centuries ago. Am I right in? in no, OK. Idea? Yeah, you're, 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 you're right and wrong, uh, but it's a good point. And um, I skipped over it. So let me come back to it. Privacy is an incredibly complicated idea. Um, and what she says is, is that the old idea of privacy was that we had a private realm, right? And in that private realm, um, you have these four privative and non-privative ideas of privacy. As the social overtakes the private, um, as we uh, increasingly um, give up our privacy in order to um, gain security and convenience, we act more and more like everyone else. The, we, we become more conformist. 
in her in her account. And you know, if we all are shopping on Amazon, we're going to read what Amazon suggests to us more and more. And if we read on Kindle and it tells us, you know, the thing about Kindle, I'm sure you, some of you have ever read on a Kindle, it actually know not only does it know when you've read the book and where, how far you've gotten, but it will tell you 66% of the people who read this line underlined it. And you're like, why do I want to know that? Well, it makes it easier to read, they think, because then you can skip around and read the important parts or focus on them. And you can't turn this off on Kindle. You can't not know what people are reading and underlining. And so the idea is you start to read what everyone reads, um, or, or, or that's the worry. And so what she says is, as we become more conformist, as the social and as society begins to more and more determine our thinking and our actions and our behavior, we rebel against the social. And we develop a new idea of privacy, which is called the intimate. Um, and the, the great thinker of the intimate is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And so she cites Rousseau talking about the rise of the intimate sphere as opposed to the private sphere. And um, there's a lot to be said about this. On one level, uh, the intimate, the, the private sphere is the sort of private property. It's where you actually have a space and a sacred space that no one can intrude on where you can be free from public, right? It's the walls, the boundaries, the space of who you are and where you can develop as a private, unique person. It's where you can become a racist, John. It's where you can become prejudiced. It's where you can develop your thoughts and not worry about what other people are going to think about them not worrying about, you know, political correctness or anything else. When you enter the public world, she says, you can't do that anymore. You, you have to be respectful and you have to treat people as equal citizens. But in the private realm, you can be unique, different, a bit ra raunchy or a bit, you know, off the wall or whatever it is. And she thinks that's an important part of life. The intimate is something different, right? The intimate, which... Um, arises with Rousseau is um, is not about uh, de developing our, 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 our private realm where we encounter the sacred. It's where we, uh, it's, it's developing our sort of, our, our rich inner life, um, which uh, is important and she thinks meaningful, um, but is not a replacement for the private realm of property uh, and borders and boundaries. Um, there's a lot, it, 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 it raises lots of questions uh, about the relation between the intimate and the, um, and the private realm of property. Um, but on, I guess the most, well, I guess what I wanna say most importantly is that the intimate doesn't provide you with a hiding place. It doesn't provide you with a secure place where you can develop an entire uh, hidden life. Um, it's, it's a reaction against the social and thus conformism rather than a reaction against publicity and appearance. And thus the intimate is always going to sort of emerge in response to society and it's, conformist claims upon you as opposed to being a place where you can develop in your own way. Um, if that's, if that's uh, fair, does that answer your question or not? I'm, I can't hear you, but you can turn your mic on, John. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's helpful. That's very helpful because, you know, because you have, you know, distinguished them intimacy and, and privacy well. Yeah, I mean, she says, if you want to look on page 69, seen from this viewpoint, the modern discovery of intimacy seems a flight from the whole outer world into the inner subjectivity of the individual, which formerly had been sheltered and protected by the private realm. So formerly the individual was protected in the private realm. As it is less and less so, we create this world of intimacy. But the dissolution of this private realm into the social 
may most conveniently be watched in the progressing transformation of immobile into mobile property until the distinction between property and wealth, between fungibles and consumptibles, loses all significance because every tangible, fungible thing has become an object of consumption. It lost its private use value, which is determined by its location. So it lost its that I had it in my house or on my property and acquired an exclusively social value determined through exchangeability. So even though I still have an inner life, it's much more mobile and social and fluctuating. Um, and thus it doesn't have the kind of solidity that the private realm had. And that's uh, a difference. It doesn't mean that the, the social, that the intimate is not important. It is, um, but uh, it's, it's less, it's less uh, solid than, than the social. Than the, than, than the private realm itself. So I see, um, let me ask this couple more questions I wanna at least look at. What would Hannah Arendt have said with regard to people who lack private property? Would they not be considered as human or capable of releasing their human capacities? That's exactly what she would have said, right? I mean, for better or worse, what she says is that slaves uh, are denied one of the essential uh, 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 qualities of what it means to be human, which is to have a private space in the world. Well, one of the things that's important to realize is that what she also says is that throughout most of human history and the history of the West, most non-slaves had property. So someone's got a microphone on. If you could turn it off, it would help. Can someone turn a microphone off? Um, but for her, it is only with the rise of capitalism and the expropriation of peasants from their land, and thus the creation of laborers, that poor people don't have land. Throughout most of human history, poor people have land. They're farmers. They're, they're, they're craftsmen with their shop. And so um, it's, it, the, 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 the rise of a landless poor is actually a fairly modern phenomenon. And that's part of what she's talking about. There's a question, in a tyranny of mass society where identity is undermined with privacy, don't acts like terrorism and lone wolf actors become existential acts? Don't RN's distinctions call for what Stopper would call a delicate balance, or Albi, not, 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 not Stopper. Um, so if I understand the question here is in a mass society or in a tyranny where people don't have um, privacy or a public realm, uh, aren't, isn't action uh, giving you a kind of existence because it makes you public um, and gives you a kind of place in the world and don't you need a balance? Uh, the general answer to that is yes. Um, although, uh, um, the problem is that terrorist actions um, generally may give you a very fleeting amount of publicity, but will then usually have you um, uh, erased from public world, either in prison or killed. Um, and uh, and but I think the the question is is a good one, and we talked about it last session in section six when we were talking about the problem of statistical society. Uh, and I just want to remind you of it because it's such an important part. It's on pages 42 and 43, where she's talking about how the rise of the social, this is, in the, this is in the chapter on the rise of the social, and the large rise of statistics and of the rise of law, large numbers obliterates political and historical action, obliterates individual action. And um, she has this line at, on page 43. Statistically, what we see is a leveling and fluctu leveling out of fluctuation. Everyone sort of starts to act more and more the same. And, and she says, in reality, deeds will have less and less chance to stem the tide of behavior. And events will more and more lose their significance. And I think what 
I don't know who this is. Ennis, oh, I'm sorry, what's your name? Ennis, anyway, um, and Mr. Ennis, Professor Ennis, um, has, is saying, is right, which is that in a world of mass society where it's harder to stand out because everybody does their own thing and thus everybody pays attention to what they're interested in, in order to stand out, in order to be seen in public, you have to do ever more radical and ever more uh, extreme acts. And of course, those ever more radical and extreme acts can then be ignored as criminal or uh, too excessive. And it makes it easy to therefore um, dismiss acts that are departures from the, the mass or the status quo. And it makes it harder to act in a way that's a true departure from the status quo that's not anti public or antisocial. Does that answer your question? Um, am I, is that all right? It's Ennis Prof, right? Who asked that? Um, there's another, yes, okay. Please comment on page 71, beginning with for the elimination. Let me see if I can find where that is. Page 71, for the elimination. I got to find where that is. Ah, so on the top of 71, necessity and life are so intimately related and connected that life itself is threatened where necessity is altogether eliminated. All right, so this is already in the next section, um, and, uh, and it's an important part. What she's saying here is that there are two great dangers of um, the elimination of the private realm, which is what she says on page 70, if you look at the paragraph. In order to understand the danger to human existence from the elimination of the private realm, for which the intimate is not a very reliable substitute, to go back to the other question, it may be best to consider these non-privative traits of privacy, which are older than and independent of the discovery of intimacy, right? So this is, again, intimacy is a new replacement, but these are the older non-privative traits of privacy, which we said were related in property and um, borders earlier. Well, now what's said is that um, the difference between what we have in common and what we own privately is first that our private possessions, which we use and consume daily, are much more urgently needed. So one aspect of the private realm of property is that in it, we are confronted with necessity. Uh, we are, we need to eat, we need shelter, we need uh, whatever it is we need to live. And this kind of uh, scarcity and necessity um, leads us to a kind of activity of laboring um, and uh, earning our keep. Um, and what she says is that um, the same necessity that from the standpoint of the public realm is only negative in that it's a, it's, it's a necessity and it's not free, but in the private realm, she says, possesses a driving force whose urgency is unmatched by the so-called higher desires and aspirations of man. Not only will it always be the first among man's needs and worries, it will also prevent the apathy and disappearance of initiative, which so obviously threatens all overly wealthy communities. Necessity and life are so intimately related and connected that life itself is threatened where necessity is altogether eliminated. The point here is that um, the private realm where you're on your own, where you have your own house, generally prohibits or prevents most people from getting too wealthy uh, that they um, stop working and stop laboring. Uh, to the extent that we create a common wealth right, in which we try and give welfare to everyone and support the, uh, the basic living abilities of everyone, which most of us, uh, many of us believe should happen, 
and RN is not saying it shouldn't, she's just telling you one of the consequences of it, you immediately begin to tell people that they have to live in private in certain ways. They have to get an education, they have to have social security, they have to have welfare, and, or, and, and, and in doing so, in giving them the benefits of the commonwealth, um, you remove from their lives a certain necessity, which was part of the uh, privation of the private realm, but which also had a certain use, which is that it encouraged people to labor and live. And that, uh, and you know, you can see this underlying much of the conservative versus liberal debates about welfare today. Arendt's not per se taking a side on conservative or liberal, but she certainly understands the arguments of some people like Charles Murray, who spoke at the RN Center last year, and who's been very articulate about this, about the way that um, uh, welfare and uh, the loss of necessity can actually uh, negatively impact the lives of the working poor. Um, and he's been very articulate about the way that that happens. The second um, danger to, of, to human existence from the elimination of the private realm she talks about on page 71 is the loss of a hiding place, right? She says the second outstanding non-privative characteristic of privacy is that the four walls of one's private property are for the only reliable hiding place from the common world, not only from everything that goes on in it, but also from its very publicity, from being seen and heard. A life spent entirely public in public in the presence of others becomes, as we would say, shallow. While it retains its visibility, it loses the quality of rising into sight from some darker ground, which must remain hidden. This is, I think, this and what comes out of it is what's so fascinating about much of what RN says about privacy, and it's what a lot of what the conference is going to talk about. We are living in a world in which we are more and more transparent in everything we do, in what we read, in what we, in who we see, in how we drive, and where we go with our cell phones and our cars. They can track everything we do. And what you hear over and over again is a cliche now, which is, and by they, I don't mean just the government, companies, our friends, our parents, our, <laughs> our families, um, what you hear is, well, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to worry about. And this has become somewhat of a mantra. And, and so in many ways, the conference is an attempt to interrogate that question. If you have, I mean, one answer is everything has someone, everybody has something to hide. I mean, there is almost, I can't think of anyone who would want everything they've ever done public, publicized on Twitter or on Facebook. There are some people, though, who believe that that's okay, and they've lived with cameras on them, and they think their entire lives should be open. But the question is, what is lost? What is the cost of an ever more circumscribed realm of property? And so this is not simply a question of civil liberties, right? Although we're going to have talks on civil liberties, and it's not, but it's a question of to what extent is a meaningful private life in which you can think and in a way that you know and talk to people in a way that you know will not be publicized, not be recorded, not be heard, not be listened to. In what way is that important to being a deep, thoughtful human being? Because increasingly, we don't have that luxury. When you chat online, when you talk on the phone, when you talk in your house, there are recording devices everywhere. And it may be true that no one will ever listen to it if you don't ever commit a crime. And yet, what is knowing that these things exist and that they may come to light mean for us? And that's, um, that's what the, the conference is going to be about. But that's what these two dangers she, she talks about uh, to, the, to what she calls to human existence. She's saying that these two dangers threaten human existence itself. These, these two things. So I see a question here. Hannah Rent often refers to the gathering of humans. 
right? Don't modern gadgets, including the one we are using now, gather people? Hannah Arendt empowers people to wait new beginnings or to expect them. And therefore, the idea that we give up more and more privacy to our detriment should be reviewed. Is there a collision between worldlessness and private property? And how do the two drive society? Good. Um, so this has been, a, I think, a debate within people who read Hannah Arendt, uh, which is an irrelevant debate, but it's also a debate in the world. Uh, but Arendt uh, has been brought in to bear on both sides of it. So some people say that the internet uh, and, and, and the connectivity of the modern world is, is a deeply Arendtian idea in that it allows um, publics to gather uh, on the internet and all over and through, the, through computers, and thus for um, people who often didn't have a public life because they, were, they didn't find people that they had stuff in common with to talk about, uh, to suddenly have a public life. So you're an Arendtian scholar in the woods of Tanzania and you don't know what to do, but now you can have an Arendt reading group or a, an Arendt website and have conversations with people and it creates a sort of um, a, a, a public world. Uh, and, and, and so many people uh, have argued that Arendt um, should be, whatever she would be, I never like to say what she would be, should be uh, excited about these new technologies and, and new ideas. And I think that there's some truth to that. On, on the other side, there are those who say, um, yes, but these new, first of all, these new um, technologies allow us to choose to only be with these people or only be with these people. So I, I'll talk to Arendtians, but not, not Habermasians or, or, or Arendtians, but not Heideggerians or, 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 or whatever it is. And, and as a result, um, we sort of, uh, instead of entering a public world, we enter a, a, a discriminatory social world, right? And Arendt says there's nothing wrong with the social world being discriminatory. It should be, but it shouldn't replace um, a public world in which we're all equal and we engage with people who are different from ourselves. And sort of the siloed discriminatory nature of the internet um, sort of allows for an incredible diffusion of the social but at a further expense of the public, um, some of these Arendtians would say. Um, at the same time, uh, to the extent we are uh, using these screens, um, we are uh, increasingly um, divorcing ourselves from a part of the world, a part of the public world, which is the world we can't control to the extent that we want to live more and more in environments that we build fully. And as you know, now I, some of you have seen that, you know, Microsoft has just come out with a new halo graphic thing where you can walk around and instead of seeing things, you see a 3D representation of them with information, et cetera. The point is we begin to live more and more in a world we create, which that's the problem. We like that. We like living in a world we create because it's a world we create to satisfy our wants and desires. And yet we start to lose this experience of being human as that there are things that we don't create. And anything that we don't create, anything that is not um, as efficient as we would like it to be, we want to change it. We want to make it more efficient. Well, that includes the earth and that includes our bodies. That includes our brain. And so what you see is the rise of artificial intelligence and the rise of, um, uh, you know, environmental engineering and human engineering. And from our end's point of view, you know, that desire to create little worlds in which we have full control over them uh, threatens, uh, threatens one part of our humanity, which is that our humility, the fact that we are chance that we are fated into the world. I see it's 1204 where we're, I, I went over a little bit. I apologize. I should probably uh, end here. Um, but uh, uh, I want to say uh, thank you. Uh, I hope it was an interesting conversation. This is, in a sense, a precursor of, of, of some of what we're going to do at the conference. And um, I look forward to seeing you guys next month. We're going to start the labor chapter next month. I'll review Section 10 briefly and then move on to the labor chapter uh, and we'll send out the reading list soon so thank you all very much bye bye thank you thank you thank you